This workshop is going to be different than our previous workshops. Our previous workshops are heavily project based. We have one major workshop or one major goal that we work through a handful of things to accomplish. This workshop is going to be different. I'm sure you've already noticed, for those of you who have been to my workshops in the past, PowerPoint is not a common thing for me. Okay? You won't see fancy transitions, you won't see anything like that, because I hate PowerPoint. It's a useful tool, that doesn't make me like it anymore. So, we'll be, there will be a lot more PowerPoint in this one. Um, this time, we're going to have a mixture of kind of your more traditional lecture-based material and some industry-type training. Okay? So, can I see by a show of hands, how many people have been to a manufacturer's control training? Handful of people. So for those of you who haven't, typical manufacturer's control training is they're going to set a product down in front of you, and they're going to talk about that product extensively over the course of a handful of days, usually focused around a week. Um, four days of presentations, back and forth between this is how you do X on this piece of equipment, okay, now you do it, okay? And the fifth day, typically reserved for a certification test. Them giving you a certificate at the end of it saying, yes, you know how to work on our equipment, go and screw up your customer stuff, okay? What they don't give you is any background training, okay? I have been to half a dozen manufacturers' trainings. Five of them involved building control systems that dealt with communication protocols like BACnet. Guess how many of those gave me any background on how BACnet works? If you guessed the flying goose egg, you would be correct. So, that is one of the places where industry fails with its training. They rely on the individual contractors or um, regional branches to train people to, with that kind of information. Same with basic electrical, same with um, mechanical, any of those types of things. Manufacturers don't care about that. If you go to contemporary controls training, and Bob can verify this because they just hosted one for contemporary controls at the College of DuPage. How did it go, Bob? I didn't go. Oh, you didn't go? But, but I, if it was you had work to do, right? Yeah, and I didn't know what they were getting into, but they used our classroom and put it together, but they, they went pretty extensive into the uh, vast view. Yeah. Uh, sure, but the vast view and how to create the front end and you know, how to get the controllers. So I've done it in a lot of them, but you're, you're pulling through their products as opposed to right. understanding how it fits the big picture. And that's sometimes you need context. Exactly. And that's what the, a lot of industry training does. Now, I threw contemporary controls under the bus right there because they are a little bit different. They're a smaller company than the big ones like Schneider or Siemens or Johnson Controls. And they actually do some more training based around some of those basics than a lot of other companies do. Okay, but generally they're going to put this product down in front of you and show you how to use this product. Okay, and they went into you know, your uh, IP, the, you know, uh, my bus. Yep, their converters. Yep, they, I mean, they really went into the I just would pop them back and forth. They, the date got set up and it's right on finals week, so. <laughs> We're supposed to be there two weeks before, but COVID restricted all that. Gotcha. So, our objectives for this workshop are going to be to build some of those basic skills and learn kind of how this whole head end or supervisory thing works. Peter. So Robert, uh, just to mention to some, some who may not know. We're using this product because unlike... We're going to get to it. Oh, okay. It's open source. Yep. So, 
Um, Peter does bring up a great point. If at any point during my presentations you have a question, please stop me and ask. I've got sections for questions at the end as well, but you don't have to save it. Um, especially once I get about one more of these cups of coffee into me, I'm going to be on a roll. Um, and if I start going too fast, if we miss something, if you don't get the concept, call me on it. Okay? That's one of those things which I struggle with with some of my students, and I'm sure you do too, is you'll be up there lecturing, you'll go over a topic, and turn back. Anybody got any questions? Crickets, right? I don't want to hear any crickets. If you've got questions, I need you to ask them. Okay? That's how we make this useful. You know it, I know it. So, all right. Okay, so I've got this term head end here. Um, we can also use the term supervisory. I meant to add that to this presentation, my failure. Um, copies of the, all the presentations will be given to you at uh, sometime after the workshop, about a week after when we get them uploaded. Okay, we're also going to build basic knowledges of the functions of a head end, okay? We can see the normal basic things that supervisory controllers or head end controllers, there are a dozen different names for it, but those are the two most common. That the things that they have to do at a minimum, okay? Most modern control systems do significantly more than this list, but for a system to be functional as a supervisor, really this is your kind of minimum stack. Okay? And we will be, as you kind of guessed, be using the contemporary controls Bass View 3 for this project. Okay, and we're going to get into the why of that here in a minute. I know I've got a slide on it, so I'm holding off on trying to over explain now and slide through slides later. Okay? So, why are we doing it more this kind of formalized, traditional way? Why are we doing it the industry way instead of our normal project-based? Well, one, I think it's important for those who haven't been through an industry manufacturer-type training to have that experience. Because once we know what that experience is, it's easier for us to be able to fill in those holes for our students. Okay. We all have a variety of students. You get some from who are out in industry and doing these kind of things. And you get some people who are totally green, whether they're coming um, day one from a different career or day one out of high school or maybe still in high school. Or maybe they graduated with a bachelor's degree and realized, now I have to get a job to pay for these student loans. Okay. Our goal, or part of our goal, is to fill in those gaps, those basic skills to make them actually useful, okay? To, or help them be useful, to, so that when their company sends them to the manufacturer's training and they use buzzwords like BACnet or communication protocol, they can go off. I know what that is. I got an idea what's going on. Instead of being the and I'm going to pick on building operators because I've been in manufacturers trainings where they've sent building operators to them and some of them really know their stuff and understand what's going on. Some of them are the pigeon in the corner pecking at the food and drinking coffee. And that's the extent of what they got out of it. Okay? Not throwing, you know, uh, not throwing shade at them by any means but they just were underprepared for that train. So, also, we have a lot of information that we're going to cover. And trying to build all of that into one large project over the time period we have would be problematic. Okay? Instead, we're going to focus on some micro projects. We're going to take each piece of it, build around it, move on to the next piece, 
that's just going to continue to add on over the course of this. By the end of it, you will have a semi-functional supervisory controller for the systems that we have available. Okay? Make sense? Uh, we do have, we're going to use the um, client built in the FastView 3. Um, we do have a handful of BACnet servers on the back row. All right, here we go. Back to Peter's question of why we're looking at this contemporary controls Bass View 3. Okay, like I said before, contemporary controls is not the biggest controls manufacturer. Okay, they've been around for years. They're a known quantity in the industry, but they're definitely not Siemens. They're definitely not Johnson Controls. Honestly, from my perspective, they're a way better company than either of those. Okay, they got their start in communication systems for building automation. Okay, these network switches that we've got scattered all around the desk made by contemporary controls. And that's basically one of the points where they got their start. Okay? As they developed out that product line, they found opportunities within building controls themselves and started making controllers that we have done some stuff with in the past, especially led by Mr. Clark, what, about four years ago, I think, at the Annual Institute? Four or five years ago, something like that. They actually used to make the chase for Johnson. Did they make those? Okay. <laughs> well, too bad they didn't. So, um, but why are we using this particular product? Okay, I spent about six months scouring the internet trying to find a product to run this workshop on, okay? The first one I came across was the Contemporary Controls device, and guess what? It was about the only viable product to run a workshop like this, and I think it will work in your labs as well, okay? Key points of why it's useful, there is no licensing with this, okay? How many other control systems do you know of that requires zero licensing. Yeah, right? There, there's about one that I can think of. Um, I'm trying to get away from that product line because of who owns it now. You, you probably know who I'm talking. Okay? Additionally, for this, there is no software. Okay? Everything that we're going to do on these controllers is done through a web browser, okay? That means it doesn't matter if you're running PC, Linux, Mac, Windows, Unix, Chromebook. Heck, you can configure these through a tablet, okay? Don't get me wrong, having gone through their menus, I'm not sure that would be exactly fun experience but it could be done, okay? So, Steve. Um, as far as iPads, mm -hmm. does it work on it? Yep, literally. Yeah, there are some physical hurdles you have to address if you're coming at it from a device that only has wireless connections. But once we get into the networking side and the practical, when we start configuring these units, we can talk about some of those and some potential solutions to deal with those problems. Okay? Robert? Peter? What did they take home at the end of the week? Oh, great question. So. You notice that your Bass View 3 was sitting on a box? That's the factory box, and the reason it's there is because you take this home at the end of this workshop. Nice. Okay? That is courtesy. They, they did. We're going to talk about the price here in a second. Um, that is, Best Center bought these. 
They were not donated. We did get a discount on them. Okay. So, yours to take home. Um, not this week. I haven't finished going through and developing the lab manual. I have it about three quarters of the way done. But by the end of June, I will have the lab manual for what everything that we do this week will be done. So you will have that lab manual to go with. Okay? And that's going to link into one of the disadvantages. But, but yeah, you take this home. Thank Peter for that one. Okay. Climate just changed here. So, also, these devices are relatively affordable. Okay? And when I say relatively affordable, that's given where the market is. Okay? Right now, if you go to Contemporary Control's website, they do not have a price quote for these because they, like so many others, are dealing with supply chain issues. Okay? But back when they did have a price quote, on the website, you know, a list price for these. Um, I think it was 1100 or 1200 bucks. Okay? Which for a fully functional supervisory controller is really a pretty good price. Our education price, I believe, it's like 1500 Something like that. Yeah. I was going to get to the point nobody pays list price. Okay? Not here with Best Center, not with contemporary controls. Because since you are Best Center members, you by default get best center's discount. So, as Bob stated, the real price that you can expect to pay, this is a guess because everybody knows what's going on right now, around 800 to 900 bucks. And the controllers are, the features I think are 200 to 22. Yeah, the Bass, Bass 22s are somewhere around 250 about right now. Less. Yeah. Which does also make them one of the most affordable controllers you could put into your lab. Okay, and their software is free, but it does require installation. So, um, what else do we have? Relatively affordable. Oh, supporting multiple communication protocols. This little box supports BACnet, Modbus, and supposedly LAN. I haven't seen the documentation on the LAN side. Again, we're going to fall back to a disadvantage here in a minute. But chances are, unless you're dealing with some older proprietary system, that means this can talk to just about everything you already have in your labs. Whether you've got Siemens, Johnson, Train, EZIO, uh, Niagara, ALC, this can talk to it. If it talks BACnet or Modbus or LAN, it'll talk to it. Okay? Like I said, notice the asterisks on LAN. There might be some license, or you might have to buy a special version to do that because LAN is. Probably Honeywell bought Niagara. Yes. They thought their own product sucked. And they were right. They absolutely did. Their product line was dying. But that's, that's a lunchtime conversation. Sure. Okay. Um, and the other, the last thing, because I don't know about you, but every time I talk to my advisory board or bring a new member onto my advisory board, they ask what product we're teaching on. And they get all fired up. Why aren't you teaching on my product? Okay? That's what's going to be useful to me, is if you can teach your students to use product X. And I say, yep, I'm sure that would be the most useful for you. But let me show you what we are teaching on. Give them a little five-minute tour of what we're teaching on and say, doesn't that look remarkably like your system? And they're like, yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? That's pretty universal. Okay? Most of these systems, yes, every system has its own quirks, its own specific order of operations where you have to do certain things. Okay? Is it our job to teach our students that? No. 
Our job is to teach the students the basics, get them into a system to learn it, and make sure that those skills are transferable to another system. And right now, I'll tell you, most of the industry systems look amazingly similar. Robin? Don't they get that if you learn one, one system and transfer it to another, you learn how to transfer it, you learn how to grow it into their next system? I mean, I just don't have to kind of amazes me that people would want you to teach their system so that they would come out and just know their system because they won't be able to transition with it. Yep, you're absolutely correct. It's like learning a second language when you're young. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a, I, I, his name always escapes me, but there's a very significant computer scientist who said, learning my first programming language wasn't too hard. It, it took some work but it wasn't that bad. Learning my second programming language was one of the hardest things I've ever done because I had to break all the habits and the things that I knew to be true from the first language. All those rules fell apart. But after that, learning the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth was super easy because I really knew the basics and I knew how the rules could be changed. That is absolutely the truth with something like this. Because I'll be honest, as much as I like contemporary controls, chances are that with the contractors in your area, contemporary controls probably is not their primary product line. They're going to be repping one of the bigger control systems. They may have this in their back pocket for budget customers, um, nonprofits, things like that, people who don't have the money to spend on, you know, their big product. It happens. Everybody has those clients, okay? But if they learn on this, then they learn their company's new system. They ever transfer into service or to another company, they're golden because they're going to pick it up much faster and easier than somebody who's only learned System X. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. Might be a pet peeve. Okay, now disadvantages, because there are some. I'm not going to lie. You probably don't have this in your lab right now. Okay, this is going to be a new piece. Back to Lanny, Lanny, sorry, having to write grants to get new equipment. Okay, I know a couple of people do actually have this in their lab right now, Jenny. Bob, Ted? No, not yet? not yet? Connie does though. Okay, I was gesturing in the right direction, just the wrong row. Okay, so it is something new. Another disadvantage, the programming this in this is Python. So it's, for those of you who didn't come from the controls industry or HVAC industry, if you came from IT, Python, aha, it's a win. For those of us coming from the control side of it predominantly, it's going to be a little bit steeper of a learning curve because it's not Sedona based. Okay, it's not that block based that is 85% of the controls market right now. Okay, so is that the most convenient thing? No. But again, hey, it's learning another language to do in, which is going to make number three much easier. Okay. Honestly, I would love to see them put the Sedona programming in these BassView 3s. I think that would be really a fantastic addition to this particular product. But, you know, as the old saying goes, wish into one hand, do something else into the other, and see which one fills up first. Okay? Another challenge, hard to acquire at this time. Like I said, Contemporary Controls is having supply chain issues. Matter of fact, all but one of these controllers came in literally last week for us. We have had them on order for um, a while. So um, if any of you maybe had an order somewhere around uh, January or February and suddenly your um, lead time jumped to a year, um, that's our fault. <laughs> because we put in an order for 30 controllers. 
So th that's, sorry about that. That's our fault, but uh, you get to take this one home, so. All right. This is also still a young product, okay? It has been out and available for about a year, year and a half, I believe, maybe two years, which in the, in the span of control systems, that is a really short time. So we, you will run into bugs. There will be things that maybe aren't the most convenient. And there will be um, challenges or lack in some of the documentation available. Okay, because their one user manual that they have available for this is uh, like 30 pages, 40 pages, something like that. And it really does not cover every question you're going to come across. Okay. It really does not read well. Um, I, I think there are some critical function things that... <laughs> they know how to communicate with other IT people. That's good. Keep doing it. Um, so documentation may be a little bit lacking. We're going to try and make up for that. That's why I'm developing you this lab manual. Because there are some things, especially when we get into like building graphics, that they really fail to tell you where you have to click to do something. And, you know, it, it takes a little bit of fiddling around to figure out how to do it. You can do it. Ah, that explains why it ends where it does. That happens. So. But that's why we're using these controllers, okay? And to be honest, with the list of advantages, very specifically that no licensing and the relatively platform independent items, this is the only one on the market, okay? Everybody else's products, if you don't have Windows, better go get Windows. Go buy a cheap laptop or run parallels on your Mac, whatever you gotta do.